up? My name is Matt working for Cinematography Database, and in this video, we're going to be looking at the cinematography of La La Land, and I hope you enjoyed my fake piano cover. I can't play the piano, but though I did used to be a jazz drummer, this movie got me in the feels, and I was not expecting that at all. I don't know, something about trying to make it in show business while your significant other is also trying to make it in show business. That hit a little bit close to home for this guy, so though I want to get into that, but uh, looking forward to breaking this down. This is shot by, well, let's get into it now. So here is our lovely slate photo, like it a lot. This is a really cool slate, um, directed by Damien Chazelle, is that how you pronounce it? I should have looked it up, and Linus Sandgren. Here's a picture of Damien uh, directing, and pretty young guy to be doing such big projects. And this is Ari, the Steadicam operator, which we will talk about a little bit later, pretty cool. And this is our DP, Linus Sandgren. Appreciate the long hair, appreciate that a lot. And as all of you probably know at this point, I should have made this breakdown a long time ago, Linus was nominated and won Best Cinematography at the Academy Awards in 2017, so congratulations. And he gave a really great acceptance speech, nice and short, no Jaws music for this guy. And he shouted out the crew, both Ari and Bogdan, and some other people who I don't know as well. So that's a real cool thing. This film was shot on 35mm film, so it's like actually a film, not a digital movie or a video, <laughs> like everything else. It was actually shot on film, and it was shot on Kodak Vision 3 500 tungsten for most of the movie. A lot of it's very dark, so you can imagine using 500 tungsten makes a lot of sense. And for the bright scenes, perhaps like the one in the background here, they were using 250 daylight for the exteriors. Uh, he said in the American Cinematographer article that he overexposed slash pulled one third or one and one third stop for the film so he gave it a little bit more light than it needed technically and that's a pretty safe way to do film and that's going to help protect the blacks and make them less grainy kind of similar to how we talked about on the fs7 video if you watched that one they shot on panavision cameras and anamorphic lenses uh two to one squeeze the c series and the 40 mil and the 75 millimeter he said were the go-to lenses primarily leaning on the 40 mil for the wider shots and we'll look at some uh, examples of these lenses moving forward, but anything wider than this has a lot of distortion, which is characteristic of anamorphic lenses, and maybe why you want them. He said that they stuck to a lot of 40 mil, though I would not be surprised if they used some of the 30s and 32s for some of these other shots, especially the Warners, which is the whole movie is like a Warner. There's a lot of distortion in the movie. It's cool. It has a nice look. There's a lot of vignetting. It's, it's pretty, it's got a little bit of that dirty look to it. So uh, they definitely pulled that off. And finally here, Panavision 4 Perf XL2 cameras. So they shot 4 Perf, which means they were going through a lot of film, a lot, fast, a lot faster than they were supposed to be or had planned to. This was planned as a 3 Perf movie, they said. So they had to rehearse more and shoot less. So add a lot of pressure on top of all these actors and one takes and doing them at sunset and magic hour, the fact that you only have so much film. So a lot on the line for a young director in DP, but they pulled it off, didn't they? It worked out pretty well in their favor. Maybe that's how we should be making movies. So here we see our two Panavision XL2 cameras, four perf shooting 35 millimeter film with our C series anamorphic lenses. They said that they shot two cameras when it was dialogue like this, and there's a lot of pretty dynamic arguments and things happening. So in that, or for that reason, they were able to shoot both ways and the director and a lot of directors like to work with work like this lately is you just shoot them you shoot them this way uh, at the same time as opposed to single one by one and you let the you let the actors just be a little bit more organic and reactive and you re you retain the timing of their acting and their uh, their momentum you're able to capture that versus doing the one by one you know they have to react off of each other and it's going to be a little bit different every time and that does affect the performance so. It's, a, it's an expensive technique. I think two cameras is more expensive for most movies than it is for a single camera. Even though you might be saving time, you have to be a certain size movie where the cost of the time offsets the cost of having an entirely separate camera package with twice the lenses, twice the film, well, not twice the film, but twice the, all the accessories, twice the camera crew, another first, another operator. It has to be a pretty big movie before that makes sense, but for this one, that's what they did, and again, worked out, <laughs> worked out pretty well, didn't it? What's interesting about this movie, and it took me a while to figure it out, is that it takes place in present day, pretty much, like they have iPhones and things like that, but at the same time, uh, you're thrown off because one, he's into such old school jazz, which is like kind of from like the... I don't know, 70s, that sort of era, 60s maybe. And then the way that they dress is also very just classic. It's a little bit, it feels retro. Like I it, I thought it was like a retro film, like from the 60s or 70s, but it's clearly not. But then they go and they confuse you even more because here they are walking on the back lot and they're shooting with a Panavision XL2. So that means it's 
not the oldest, but then they're lighting it like really old school with like, you know, mole 20Ks and like arc looking lights and silver reflectors, which make no sense. So when I watched this, I was like, is this retro? Why are they lighting it like so old school? I didn't, I didn't get it. But it's it's a funny mix of kind of a throwback old school Hollywood movie and a modern film. And it kind of like seamlessly transitions in between them. It, it was interesting to me, but it threw me off in the beginning. I didn't know exactly how to think about it, but now I... Still don't know how to think about it. So for these next four stills, we're going to look at what Panavision 35mm film looks like uh, with the C-series anamorphic. So we have the oval bokeh back here. Very nice looking. There's always a little bit of halation or kind of black promised looking stuff that happens. I think with a lot of these and uh, Pan older Panavision lenses, they have a little bit of glow to the highlights. So that's something that's always nice here. So it kind of softens the detail here and of course softens the detail on her face. It's also with the roll off of the focus, it's kind of hard to tell where the focus is sometimes, but in a nice way, in a kind of a painterly way versus there being like the focus is at my eyes and then it falls off super dramatically. I think with the Panavision Anamorphics and Panavision Primos that I've used a little bit of, the focus rolls off kind of slowly and gradually, so it gives it a nice feel. But I wouldn't say it gives it a sharp feel by any any stretch of the imagination. But there is a sharp point in the lens, of course, but it's very organic and falls off very softly. And if that's the kind of look you want, like they wanted on this movie, then that's what you go with you use in the Panavision lenses. As far as the color correct, Linus said that, uh, at least in American Cinematographer, that the main thing that they added was a couple points of blue into the shadows, and on top of uh, pulling it a stop in a third or a quarter, or whatever that was, he described it as the uh, shiny black uh, reflections in Superman's hair, because his hair's always like slicked back and reflective. I guess that's how you do that. I've, I've never heard of anybody talk about uh, that process before and giving it a name like that, but I like that a lot, so that's hashtag Superman's hair. For this one, thank you, Linus. Very, very funny. Uh, here's a pretty cool shot. This one's pretty sharp, actually. So they might have stopped down, you know, on the 50 mil or the 65, something like that. A little bit more telephoto. Not as wide. There's a lot of shots where they get really wide and really close to uh, Emma Stone. And you can tell. But this one looks like they stopped down. There's a lot of sharpness here. And um, I just thought this was a really nice characteristic shot of what C-series Panavision lenses probably look like. Or do look like. Here's another uh, very anamorphic shot. Again... I keep pulling out the 75 mil shots or 100 mil for something like this. This is definitely not a 30 or 40 mil. I don't believe it seems pretty far to be over the shoulder of Ryan Gosling and be able to land in a shot like this. And we see that not only does the this give you extremely shallow depth of field, but even in the wider lenses, maybe this is somewhat curved architecture. I feel like these lenses do a little bit of this, a little bit of that barrel distortion. And uh, is, is a cool look. Is a really sought after look. And I, I really want to shoot with these for something. It's going to be for YouTube, so I don't know how that's going to work out, but I will try. And then here's the last shot that I wanted to analyze in this style. Just looking at the Panavision lenses and overall, this is definitely a straight line here, but it bows it out, and you see the bowing that's happening on this grid of tiles here, yet in the center, fairly undistorted. And something also to start to pull out uh, that we're going to talk about more in the movie is the use of color. Both the production designer and Linus Sandgren used color to quite... Uh, a dramatic and kind of music video effect, but uh, shooting on film and the color correction and the way it was used, because considering it's a musical, I think worked really well. And here we see it. Um, not only is the wall pink and the green is pink, or maybe the wall is white. Maybe the wall is white. I'm, I'm mistaken. I think the wall is probably white because the grout in here is white as well. But we have a pink top source from above. The top source from above. The top source from above is pink, and that's going to be tinting, unless this wall really is pink. I think that wall is pink. I take it back. I think the wall is pink, and I think they're also top lighting with a little pink as well, and contrasted with green. So red and green, good contrast colors. And then the skin tone is being preserved. She's being lit with a white light, probably some sort of little LED panel or a little softbox from above with some crate on it to keep it off the back walls. This is our first look and talk about some of the color other than the blues that he added into the blacks. So let's talk about the intro that this guy thought up and this guy shot. So I believe they rehearsed for a full day uh, with the full with the whole team, with the camera crew and the talent. And before that, they'd been re rehearsing for days or weeks using the director's iPhone to walk around and figure out the angles. And then I believe they shot this for two days, only for like two hours because they were shooting it at a very specific time of the day. And also this was split up into three different takes because of the direction of the sun. It starts off kind of pulling backwards quite a bit or, you know, You'll go watch the intro. I can't play it for you in this video. I wish I could. But it's, it starts sliding along the camera, along the cars, 
picks someone up and then pulls back and then it flips around in a big whip pan. In that whip pan, they're hiding a cut to another shot where the sun has moved directions because if the sun was in the same direction it was when they were pulling back, when you turned around, you would have seen the camera shadow. So that's what happened. And then there's one more time where it whips again and then it changes to a steady cam shot. I can't do the, I can't show you the frames of it. Not until the studios allow me to do that. Maybe that's happening in the future. And for certain things, it is actually happening. So moving on, here is the shot of the rig they were using. Um, this is, I believe, for the beginning part of the film where they're sidetracking along the cars. So they have this electric car back here. I forget the name of it. And we have a movie bird 45 on that. So it's the movie bird isn't actually swinging in this case. It's just keeping its arm out and the car is driving along. And that's how they're getting that movement. Down here, the hero is the Oculus forehead, which I can show you a screenshot of later. So this is how they did the first shot. It's just side swiping along all the different cars and they're playing different music. And then eventually the arm extends out and goes and finds the first person singing the theme songs of the whole movie. Here's another shot uh, again. So this crane is from Cinemoves and the crane operator we'll, we'll find a picture of in a second is Bogdan. So shout out Bogdan. I was actually gonna possibly be in LA doing a car commercial, which did not end up happening, but I reached out to Bogdan after seeing this and I was like, you have to be the techno crane person on my commercial. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. That would have been a fun thing if I could have YouTubed it. Probably couldn't have. Anyway, uh, the vendor Cinema moves in LA, uh, one of the people that have the Oculus head and this movie bird and uh, who Bogdan works with. Here's another shot of that same scene. Oculus head, movie bird 45, and you can tell here that they've changed orientations, that the base of the crane is not to the side of the barrier here, it's really more in the back. And so that's when you see the head whip around and change, they've moved the position of the crane to deal with the sun and just the moves that had to be accomplished. This is after they've clearly moved it. Here is a screenshot from that scene, and I believe that there is no lighting artificially here. It's all just picking the right time of day, which is great, but kind of stressful for everybody to have to nail it because you only get so much time and it took them two days to do it, which sounds pretty good. Kind of expensive, but you know, big movies do big things. Here's a pretty cool wide shot. This is when they're on that big moving platform, it looks like. I don't know. That's a, that's a different platform. That doesn't look like they're driving on it. It looks like they just kind of posted up. I don't know the exact breakdown. But a uh, fun custom grip rig here, Movie Bird 45, Oculus, and I'm assuming Bogdan down there operating, just they shut down the highway. Big scene, here's Bogdan operating, pretty cool here. Another shot, Oculus head, Panavision XL2, Movie Bird, another shot. And here, I don't know exactly when it happened, but this is Ari right here. I won't say his, um, his Instagram handle on the, on the video. But that's what it is in case you want to follow him. He posts pretty cool photos. He's on really awesome projects, clearly. Uh, at this point, he's on a riding crane or a standing crane, which uh, we'll be seeing more of in a little bit. And here's the camera and kind of ends the scene as they pan up, or well, not pan up, boom up. And um, he's, he's handling that shot for this whole part here. Another shot, and that's what it looked like through camera. You know, there's something about film that looks so filmic. So moving right along, we're going to be looking at Sebastian's apartment and the different lighting setups for it. Uh, Linus talks about it in the American Cinematographer article, and we're going to look at photos of it. So here's our most neutral look. Uh, pretty desaturated. There's very little, like, saturated colors. He's wearing a very desaturated blue shirt, dark desaturated blue shirt, and this red calendar also pretty desaturated. And we have pretty much neutral white light coming through the windows, which I'm assuming is just going to be like an 18K in natural light, something like that. I don't know if this was staged or not, doesn't super matter, but it changes pretty quickly as time goes on. So here we have the lens flare from the C-Series and we see a pretty heavy vignette up in the corner and all of this stuff is 100% intentional. They're not like, oh, that's what that looks like, cool. They tested and tested and tested to find this stuff and this I believe is an 18K out the window, it looks like it is location based on those trees outside and it's hitting him. I believe it is location. I believe this whole thing is a real location practical. It's an 18K coming right at the window or maybe like an M18, a slightly smaller source and perfectly placed so that when the camera is in the right position, it catches the flare for the right part of the song and the narrative. So that's a flare being used on purpose and a light posi positioned on purpose to get that at a certain time in the scene. And here is Linus standing there thinking about the light. And there's a whole story about... Um, how he chose this kind of lighting for this scene. Uh, the gaffer had originally put up like a space balloon and tried to just make a normal soft moonlight look and Linus decided to push the whole thing towards this kind of 
electric green and i think there's like the whole crew was kind of like uh, are you sure about that you know maybe you're tired we've been shooting all day <laughs> and linus pushed for it and he said the reasoning behind it was he was picturing like a big neon sign outside of the window that would have been kind of like ugly and offensive um because like this apartment that sebastian's living in isn't supposed to be fancy or anything like that it's supposed to be kind of like crappy la crappy anyway and um that was kind of his motivation for it and he kind of said his MO for the whole movie was to take normal situations and enhance it. So this is like him using his imagination of what's outside the window. And I was really interested in this scene when I saw it because after doing the digital Sputnik workshop, I'm starting to have a lot more interest in doing more in-camera coloring like this. So like instead of doing this color correct in post, why don't we do it on set and actually use the colors like this? So it's a little bit, it's always a little bit risky to use colors like this. It can look a little bit club, look a little bit artificial. But in this case, I think it worked really well. And I also think on film, film in the highlights is not going to get overly saturated and clipped. So film does a nice job of capturing color really well. Um, probably without having to do too, too much color correction in the end. That's probably making light of the colors that worked on this. But I think that film does a nice job with colors um, just naturally. So we have a, a natural in-color camera correct, color correct happening here with the orange practical above. And then the green which is, I believe, LEDs and HM, like an LED mix of some sort, like LED tubes, perhaps. I don't remember which ones. Gelled green coming through the windows. That's what's happening here. And we see the color contrast in the orange on his forehead. Pretty cool. Uh, this is the scene where he comes home and he surprises her. But although it's a nice romantic scene, the lighting kind of shows and I feel like foreshadows that this is going to be an, kind of a, a rough argument or something. We, they end up fighting and it's like the first time we kind of sense that their relationship is uh, in jeopardy and it's difficult. This is uh, in the bedroom and this is Sebastian and Mia's color palette, in my opinion. We see this come back more and more and uh, we have pink up here and we have purple or dark, dark blue. And uh, again, I think it's just kind of like neon Hollywood signs uh, motivated, but we see this color over and over again in the movie and I'll try to point it out when I see it the next time. Here it's uh, same scene, so uh, not unmotivated, but, you know, a heightened reality uh, musical lighting happening here. And then this scene, which is a very sad scene for me, um, this is where they're imagining, uh, or there's this alternate reality where they end up together. And it has, again, the blue overhead light like we, we saw in the other scene. And then this is red, I think, but it's kind of the pink. So, like, the the pink and, pur pur pink and purple, red and blue color, we see this again uh, when they're together. So that's kind of their color palette, in my opinion. So here's a fun scene where her three friends are convincing her to go out to a party. And we're starting from above. It's at night. And the thing to pay attention to right now is this shadow, how hard it is in the direction of it. So we'll look at what's actually lighting them in a second. Uh, what happens is they start above and it slowly comes down and levels out and then turns into a walking shot. So it's basically a, a crane to steady cam shot. We'll look at a picture of that in a second. And I believe this is an uncolor corrected still from the trailer because that's where I pulled the footage from. It's from the trailer and B-roll footage that's allowed to be used uh, for marketing purposes. And that's what I'm, that's how I'm positioning this video. That's what it's for. And I think in color correction, they kind of balance this out a little bit and add a little bit of blue to the whole thing. But you can clearly tell that there's a light somewhere um, doing all this stuff up here coming down. And you can tell, you can kind of guess the angle based on this shadow. It's pretty high, pretty pretty overhead, but a little bit of an angle there. And I think in color correction they kind of smooth this out a little bit. But um, uh, good to analyze the lighting. Here is the setup. Here is Ari, uh, rehearsing during the day. So they rehearse all day, and then they shoot it at magic hour. That's kind of the mo of this whole movie. Uh, and we'll I have a whole section dedicated to the the twilight of the film. And so here they are, not in high heels, not in not in wardrobe, just practicing the dance and practicing the camera move. So you can imagine that this walk-off crane here, which I believe is made by Leonard Chapman, not positive, but we'll be seeing some of those at the old uh, Leonard Chapman product showcase that's happening May 7th. I'm just going to throw this in, pitch it real quick. May 7th, I'm going to be presenting at the Leonard Chapman product showcase in Los Angeles. I'll link to it below if you're interested in seeing any of this stuff in real life. That's what we're going to be doing. So here's Ari again. You can imagine that it started up really high and it came down and then he walks off and it turns into a normal steady cam shot. Pretty cool. So that's how they pulled this one off. Also pretty cool in the background here is clearly what's been lighting this whole scene. So what I'm guessing and I see here is an Airy M90 back here, HMI, going through a plus, a plus green gel. Half plus green, I'm thinking, something like that. And this, I think right here, 
is a K5600 Blackjack. I think that's what it's called, or Big Eye, or something like that. It's the K5600 HMI 18K that's allowed to be hung straight down without overheating. That's the, the, the pitch for it. And it also looks like it has plus green on it as well. And it is oriented very, very tilted down, like 45, 50 degrees straight down, uh, 45 degrees down that, that angle. And so we have two lights that are gonna go very high in the air. One's gonna be going straight down and one's gonna be hitting I think the deep background. So if we go back to something like this, you can imagine that blackjack is up here at that very steep angle with the plus green, which is subtle. And that other one then is shooting off into the distance. Or maybe they didn't use it at all. Or it's potentially that the blackjack is straight down hitting them like this, and the other HMI is hitting the background. Something like that. So fairly simple lighting setup. No balloons, not lighting the deep, deep background. It's not, it's not inexpensive, but there's much bigger night exterior lighting work. That's a very, a very simple way to approach uh, a, a night exterior, in my opinion. Here is some more fun shots of them rehearsing during the day. I don't believe they're shooting any of this. Looks like way too bright. Um, and I think what's interesting as well here is that this is kind of like, speaking to the retroness of this, is that they're using extremely bright primary colors here. Uh, in the wardrobe, and that's something they kind of did when Technicolor and, to my understanding, to when, when Technicolor and color film started to be a big deal, and that was a big selling point, was like, oh, look at the colors of the movie, you have to go watch it. They would put people in outfits like this, whereas today things are a little bit more more complex, perhaps, or, or subtle. Um, but I thought that was kind of an interesting throwback uh, fashion-wise. Another cool still from this one. And here is Ari operating another shot. Uh, I, I would guess just rehearsing this scene because it's clearly daytime and this scene was shot completely in magic hour, like half the movie. Here's another big sequence of the pool, and this is, I don't have this completely figured out. I believe it's a couple takes hidden together, though I don't know, again, I don't know how they did it. And we're going to try to figure it out here because I didn't break this down. I could have made it in 3D. Maybe I should start doing that. But we follow behind Emma Stone. I think she came out of the bathroom. I'm pretty sure that's what's happening. And she's walking out into this party and it's like snowing. First of all, like snow globe snowing. And so this must be steady cam. And then look at the, the architecture here. So we have the main roof, and then to the left, a little bit of a side uh, area. So that's where we can keep ourselves oriented. So this is steady cam because there's nothing up there. There's just people up there, right? So we, we're pushing out. And I don't have the whole sequence. And then at some point, it turns into this shot. And I, I'm still confused by this. Let's, let's just go through the sequence. We look up. Again, there's nothing up there. There's just people. And then the guy falls down into the water. This must be all still steady. This still can't, this can't be steady cam here. And then you're under the water. This is where I'm assuming is the cup point, but I don't know how they got the, the camera in the water in the first place. And then you're underwater. And then you come back up and it starts spinning around in circles. You've seen the movie. You haven't seen the movie. Go see the movie. What's going on? Um, so here's the behind the scenes photo. And I'm still just confused about this because she comes out from over here. And then the camera goes into the water and it's looking up. And then it comes back up, and there's people up here that jump down, and then it starts spinning around in circles. So I don't get it. I don't know how they made that happen, but this is what's going on. This is a Leonard Chapman crane, and I will cut to a picture of it. And this is a special underwater Leonard Chapman remote head. And it's not the hydroscope. The hydroscope is a kind of like waterproof underwater techno crane. This is just a fixed length crane under the water. So clearly this is how they're doing the under the water GoPro selfie stick shot where they're spinning it around. But I honestly didn't catch the transitions. It's clearly steady cam, and they're not, when they look up, that's this balcony here. So there were people there, and I missed the transition. So even looking at the behind the scenes, I'm still confused by it. Pretty cool old school. We have some park cans here, just tungsten park cans banging, uh, picking people out, and then lit in 360. So a lot of this stuff, this up lighting and a lot of practicals to just add. Uh, reflections and stuff that look good and these people are all being lit by looks like um i'd assume like an 18k up here into a bounce there's like a big light source coming down which you can't really see but you can kind of sense the shadow from this so we kind of know that it's coming from like whoop like up here uh is a big hmi maybe just an 18k hard maybe in a softbox slash moonbox maybe a bounce like i i for something like this, it could be like a 20 by 20 overhead with two 18Ks bounced into it. Something like that is going on in this scene. Again, still looking at the behind the scenes, still don't know what's going on. So this is the Chapman Leonard uh, underwater head, I believe, with some sort of underwater housing. And the Chapman Leonard uh, fixed length crane, which I linked to uh, before. So a lot of this movie takes place at magic hour and at night. And this is when they're using the high speed film. 
And I really like the way that he's choosing to light a lot of this stuff. So the, this is not a high ISO movie. Like you look over here, if you shot this with like a red Epic W, that would be like, oh, you would see all of it. It would look like Las Vegas, even in Los Angeles where it's, it's pretty bright and there's a lot of smog, so that gets lit up. Uh, in this case, it, that's very dark. And I haven't seen night exterior lighting this like this for quite a while because again, Alexa red cameras, they're so good in low light. Um, but even at 500 uh, ASA, downrated to like 250 or 200, you don't see much in the background. So this is old school and this is the way that I learned how to light night exteriors, which is very much to do something like this, where you're kind of lighting up the atmosphere, not hazing it, but you're lighting up a little bit of the atmosphere and you're silhouetting things like this. So you'll, you'll see night exteriors like this in older movies where they're, they're hiding a backlight behind a tree, they're hiding a backlight behind a building like this, and you're just catching this really hard light source. And if you, I could go find some of my old music videos, I would do this with 1.2 HMIs, not 18 case, and I would light in a similar way and, you know, utilize shadows and um, silhouettes as well. So I really like this. So I'm assuming there's an 18K popping out from back here, doing some of this guy, which is all of this. And then there's probably another one or two lighting up this building because, again, at 200 ASA film, uh, you don't see anything. So those practicals are real. Those are real, but this building, I think, is probably getting a little bit of love, I'd guess, from maybe another light over here, something like that. So that's a little bit of old school night, night exterior lighting. This, I would believe, is mostly practical. This looks like it has a hit on it. This, uh, where would that light be coming from? It's hard to tell. It looks like, no, no, no. So there's definitely this shadow here. So there's something going on. There's something hitting this and that and this, I believe. So there's a, I would assume there's a source over here to some degree. Maybe I'm overthinking this, but again, 200 ASA, you don't see much, though they did nail the magic hour here. Unless it's a sky replacement. It looks pretty real, though. And they went down the street for this, too. Moving on, uh, just straight up magic hour. They talked about how much they loved this old school um, kind of memory or thought of what Los Angeles would look like. So it's kind of a mix of modern and retro. I, I, can't, I think LA changed a lot of their... Street lamps, and if you watch the film, these street lamps are always flaring the lens in kind of like interesting ways along the edge of the frame mostly. And uh, they both talk about that I believe Linus and the director are not LA natives, so they're not from Hollywood. And they both uh, really, when they thought of Hollywood at night and, and Magic Hour, um, these practical old school lamps were a big part of that visual for them. So they added them in. A very uh, famous piece of architecture here looks like another uh, plus green HMI lighting up this wall here. Very simple, just HMI hard from the right angle. Very much how they're approaching the night exteriors. And uh, just calling out how much distortion there is on this wide lens. And again, to light this, I'm pretty sure it's the HMI from above coming from this really steep angle like this. Just one HMI, one drop shadow. And then these neon practicals here. A little bit of a green blue color correct. Going on, uh, same thing as well for this close-up. A lot of distortion in this shot too. So that was a quick look at the lighting exteriors for the night. Again, same situation going here. Very uh, placed practicals, designed, very flary. And to get all of this light doing this situation, there's going to be an 18K up here out of frame on a crane. Backlighting the whole thing, I would not be surprised if this whole scene is that one 18K, that blackjack uh, K5600 light. The practicals and then I didn't I didn't put the still in it but they show that they're hand holding like some sort of LED or tungsten light on a boom pole and just walking it with it for the close-ups big backlight some practicals float a key light you do in la la land exterior lighting here we can clearly see that there's um, a story coming this way and I believe when I read this that because this scene right here which is a big long one take is uh, has a cliff that falls off 300 feet in one side and then it's a big u-turn basically is where they shot it. it. was difficult to light, but they ha basically had two condors, one with an 18K on one side and an 18K on the other side. This is the 18K hitting them, and then all this other deep background lighting is the other 18K. So it's just kind of like big back cross lighting just with 18Ks really far away. That's essentially the approach, plus these practicals, and then catching it at the right time of day to have the sky be not pitch black. So we have the practicals. They're getting lit by that here and then there's going to be some 18ks again i think coming something like this one from each side whole sequence goes down the sun comes up so it's incredible to be able to nail that i'm sure it only looks like this for like 30 minutes and then it starts to look like daytime and it's like way less cool way less fun i think it's like the cover of the movie or something like that and so here's them actually doing the shoot and we're shooting straight 24 frames per second and we have the frame count here or the frame count the, the foot count of how much film is left is usually what's happening here 
and this is what was it? It's like one five uh, two five five. The aspect ratio, something kind of odd and retro. And you can see how actually bright the scene is. And I'm assuming this is not the one that made the movie because the movie has this really pretty twilight going on, unless they comped it back in, which I'm not uh, familiar with. If they did, they shot this for quite a while, rehearsed it for like an entire day, pretty sure. And um, this is what the lighting looks like. So now it's a lot more. Uh, obvious that there's a 18k up here on a condor coming down boom these practicals are not as subtle as they appear in the film they're very they look to be fairly bright to be flaring out the behind the scenes camera and i'm assuming that this here there's another 18k that's further away than this one that's why it's not cost casting as much of a double shadow and here's a shot of mr bogdan uh practicing this move i think it was like something like 32 different points that he had to hit to make this sequence happen, so rocking this gigantic Cinemoves movie bird, 45 foot crane with the Oculus head at the end. This is them rehearsing um, before magic hour. So I'm assuming you would shoot this in the morning, maybe, and then also uh, right before nighttime. And here's another behind the scenes shot of the Oculus head and them rehearsing. The base doesn't move. It's all happening with Bogdan swinging the arm around, extending it. And then whoever is doing the head operation. Was it Linus? Linus, did you operate the head on this? Because that's that's some badass stuff right there. I would try to do that if I could. But I don't blame you if you handed it off to someone else because it's kind of stressful and you should be looking at perhaps other things. This is one of my favorite parts of this whole movie. And it's kind of cheesy. It's like, oh, a, a movie theater scene with like haze and a projector. I know. I know. And then flaring it out. What do you think? J.J. Abrams like, I know. It's like kind of cheesy. But I, I at this point in the movie, I, I started to really um, relate to these characters a lot. And I don't have a picture of it, but the reverse shot of this scene looks so good with the projector on air. And some for some reason, no one in the movie theater is freaking out and being like, why are you standing up there? They didn't care. Here's the reverse. It's not a great still of it. I could have picked a different still. I, I At this point in the movie, I was like hooked. I, re I really liked it. Big old projector anamorphic bokeh. Not the craziest flare either. You know, these are, these are still somewhat um, keeping the flare under control, considering there's a projector right at them. I, I really liked this scene here. Assuming... Fairly hard but soft, like you know, four by four, eight by eight source coming from the side to far key them. You know, pretty diffuse. The projector, maybe that's a real projector hitting them with this little backlight with the edge has a little bit more blue than the key, uh, and then blue in the shadows. A little bit of flare happening here as well. Maybe that's part of this flare, that sort of thing. Uh, some tungsten practicals or tungsten up lights for architectural lighting in the background. And this scene uh, apparently covered using the Leonard Chapman hydroscope. So this is their techno crane. Their telescoping crane is the hydroscope. Um, Claudia Miranda uses it quite a bit. And we're going to be checking that out at the product showcase, which is May 7th in Los Angeles. And this is their mini CL head, I believe. I'm still modeling all these in 3D. I don't know all their heads all that well, but it's a nice compact head. And they make different size hydroscopes from like 50 feet super long to mini scopes, which we're going to be doing maybe a review of for YouTube. They can fit right on a dolly or tripod in a pretty, um, you know, pretty affordable overall for a rental. And they allow you to do shots that are not really possible with gimbals, jibs, or dollies. You know, so there really is a place and a time for techno cranes, and that's what we're or telescopic cranes, and we're gonna be looking at that uh, at the workshop slash presentation in LA. Moving on, I don't have a ton of stuff from this scene, but this is the observatory. And funny enough, I just went to an uh one of these things with my kids at the Museum of Science in Boston. Shout out MOS in Boston, and uh, my son was terrified of it. He's about four. He loves the plants, but he was absolutely terrified of it. When you grow up, it's it's not so terrifying. It's more lovely. I don't know if this is green screened or what. Like what? Did this really happen? Did they really project this? I feel like this was green screened. Um, I don't remember the exact story for it. And there's probably someone who knows better than I do, but there is this cool photo behind the scenes. And these are Colorados, I believe. So these are like, these days, these would be digital Sputniks or sky panels. But, but for whatever reason, they're using kind of like the theatrical movie or the theatrical television lights, which I've used Colorados and color blazes and chroma cues and all that good stuff. Um, it allows you to do full color, so RGB A, RGB A or RGBW, just like Sputniks and Sky Panels. They're just a little bit... Um, I, I, I think that the, the new generation of colored lights for the movie industry, I, I feel like they look a little bit better. I could be completely wrong. I've shot commercials with these exact same lights before, but we have a big diffusion overhead and a big sea of different colored LED lights, and that's what's going on. And okay, yes, yeah, so this was blue screened and they chroma keyed in, or they keyed in or comped in that sky stuff, because to capture that would have been pretty, pretty tricky. 
Okay, so we're starting to kind of wrap this up, um, but this is a big sequence here. This is where they're in the club, so the jazz club. Whenever he's in this kind of night exterior situation, we're going to look at some of the lighting happening here. And what my lighting setup is semi-inspired by today. I didn't haze my room because I don't want to set up my fire alarms. So this is when she first walks in and they do the whole um, theatrical gag where she walks into a spotlight essentially and then they dim all the other lights around them to kind of isolate her. It's a very theatrical, almost trope of, of a Hollywood or, or you know theatrical movie very like Shakespearean kind of feeling thing. Not that I said Shakespeare in a funny way. I don't mean that in a bad way. But it's it's kind of a trope. It's kind of funny. I, if I ever did a lighting gag like this, I feel like I, I feel like I've been snickering the whole time. But they use it to great effect here. It 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 isolates them. It's a very Romeo and Juliet kind of look here, and they do it several times. Looks like a square eyelight, so not so much into the round eyelights for this movie. And here's a behind the scene shot of where the lights dim and it's hazed, and we see just Ryan Gosling playing the piano. It's just a simple parkan. Google Altman Parkan, and it's like $5 on eBay or something like that in the bulb. Probably a medium flood bulb, something like that, maybe a narrow spot. Uh, really cooking someone, it's pretty hot. It's a, it's a very hot light temperature-wise to be on someone that closely. And it also looks like there's a little bit of a skirted soft light. So there's a little bit of soft light and a whole lot of hard light on his face here. Uh, this is what it looks like through camera. Definitely clipping out super crazy there, but controlled in color correction and film does enjoy a little bit of overexposure. A fatter negative. And here is a close-up of that same scene. Pretty cool. Uh, a lot of bokeh happening here. All oval. I don't know why the bottom part is cut off. So what typically happens with a map box is you have, this is the front of the map box like this, and the lens, right? And with anamorphic, you're going to get, instead of it being a circle bokeh, which is kind of a reflection of this you can think of, it's squeezed, so the, the, the aperture here becomes um, oval like this. 2x, it's squeezed this way. And the reason you're going to see bokeh actually have weird shapes like this is because of hard mats and top flags. So to prevent lens flare when you don't want it, which these lenses will flare like crazy and distractingly crazy, you don't always want it, is they'll put a hard mat on it, and it will basically cover just the part of the lens that needs to be covered to make sure that the only only the just amount of the just the right amount of light is coming in, all the rest of it gets blocked. And when you do that, when you do that, it makes shapes like this and it cuts the bokeh off at the bottom. So that's what's going on with this shape here. It's the same thing with a top French flag or a side flag or a bottom flag. And it's actually why on a lot of the projects I do, uh, where bokeh is a, a thought, where the bokeh is part of the design, is I don't use any hard mats. So a lot of the firsts I work with will bring them in, or the seconds will keep them, and they'll, and they'll stick them in there because that's kind of the practice, uh, is that you don't even necessarily ask the DP, it's just something that's done. But I actually stop uh, requesting them, so I don't even bring them in most cases now because I don't like the look of this kind of bokeh. Not that this is bad because you have to stop flares when you have to stop flares, but I, I like the bokeh to just stay around. It also could be something else, including the lens, but um, when I see bokeh that is cut off in certain places like that, that's typically what is happening. And I can show that in an actual video later, maybe. Uh, more wide shots, a lot of Christmas practicals, and kind of assuming park hands again, just park hands in the ceiling with some diffusion on them, hitting them like this. So this is when they first cross each other. Uh, more of the same here. And this is a different scene. This is when she goes to dinner with her like boyfriend. And they're shooting with two cameras here. Pretty cool. Uh, one for this guy and one maybe that looks like maybe for him. Or maybe it's a two shot. I can't tell. But a fairly simple lighting setup. And this is a Matthews maxi boom or something like that. I've used these a couple times. I, know I didn't set them up. But they're really nice compared to um, Menace Arms, the old school way. These are really nice. And a lot of my key grips don't like them because they're expensive and they're really heavy. But... I like them, but I guess that doesn't matter. I'm just the DP. I don't get to call this stuff out necessarily. I just like the small footprint. It, the th this thing's at like a perfect right angle. There's no huge counterbalance like this crap happening. And it's easy to change the height of it a little bit easier. Matthew's made it. I wish more people would use it. Uh, looks like a 4x4 LED mat or something like that. I don't know what it exactly it is, but they're filling it up. It's very soft overhead. And they're keying over all this warmth. So she's going to get a lot of very white light. And they're going to look really nice. And because of all of this other stuff is very warm tungsten stuff, the background will be nice and warm. And they're going to be keyed white. That's what's going on. Director, I don't have a shot from this scene, though. But I remember the scene very well. Here's a shot of Ari operating one of the jazz clubs. Again, I'm assuming all of these tungsten hits are just park hands. Park hand, very narrow spot. 
that's going on. Um, mostly tungsten, and they color corrected a little bit blue. Here is the hydroscope again, Chapman Leonard, mini CL head, something like that. Little tiny 200 foot mag, that's like the itty bitty foam mag on there, hilarious. Super cute. Pandavision, can I please have one of those for my for my YouTube show? I really want one. I haven't pitched this to you yet, but I want to keep a Pandavision camera like right here. I want the small mag for the XL2. We'll talk, we'll talk. So here is uh, another shot from that same club scene. I don't know if it's the same time. It looks like it's a little bit different, but there's a lot of blue happening in the color correction and the blacks here, and there's a lot of bluish flare as well. But the same, you know, parkan up here, parkan directly for you, parkan back here. I guess this whole scene is mostly parkans, maybe some light mats. So I think a lot of us have seen this. I didn't want to play the whole clip because it's not mine. I just, I can't really show it. But um, we see uh, Ari operating here, and he's got himself fully twisted, which a lot of camera operators you have to do this for certain shots. You know, you have to be very uncomfortable to to be a camera operator. In many cases, we have our still stills unit here, and this is the shot. And someone put this together, pretty cool. This is Mia dancing. And we see uh, Ari pointing the camera this way. And if you remember this part of the movie, it's panning back and forth. And we see the director right here tapping him on the shoulder to cue him when to pan back and forth, which I thought was pretty funny. So this is what it looks like the other way. And we see that Ari's completely untwisted and, you know, human robotic remote head. Uh, pretty cool, difficult scene to pull off. I've actually had to do a scene like this with like a dialogue where you're like, he's talking, now they're talking, and they're talking. It's, it's tricky. Um, and this one, I think they had the music to go through, so maybe that's a little bit easier with the tap dancing and stuff, but um, definitely a team effort between the director and the, the camera operator right there. Go find the clip. It's pretty awesome. And wrapping up this sequence is the ending of the movie. Super sad. Super, super sad part of the movie. Um, I like the ending to this a lot, but it, is, it really was uh, sad for me. These look like... Uh, I don't know, that is an extremely narrow beam. I was going to say Colorado as well, but some sort of, I'm assuming, LED changing color light blue with, again, the the red curtain. As a, a, this, is the, this is the Mia and Sebastian color palette that they're lighting the scene with. He's getting keyed with the white light, yet we have the blue, um, the blue light that represents their love and their time together. And then this is like one of the final shots of the movie, again, with the, the purple background and the blue key light so so pretty cool uh to see this color palette for them continue through the entire film i think that's cool and to wrap up this breakdown on a happier note this is from that kind of dream sequence where they're walking through an old school hollywood movie together and and having a good time and what what could have been their lives together this is the mural that they come out from under the bridge which i don't have a shot of fake leaves um there's a lot of things happening here we could talk about uh this is a clearly a, a mural and we have space lights up here that have definitely a blue tinge to them. So I'm assuming these are some sort of LED space light. Unless they use tungsten and gelled it blue. It's possible, but you know, actually that's what it looks like. Because if you look how warm the top is, it looks like that's the tungsten light kind of popping out. And then the bottom is blue. So maybe they just gelled the targets blue. So it's a little bit white at the top and blue at the bottom. I, get, I, don't, know. <laughs> I don't know. That's what it looks like to me. Uh, we see that the set is like this. So if we looked overhead, we're going to have a wall like this. And when you're doing these scenes where you're transitioning from like here to there, uh, instead of having the set be like that, uh, production designers tend to like the, the set to be like this. So it's actually faster to get to the next set than to go straight across. That's something I've learned the hard way. I'll just tell you that much. 100% do that if you can pull it off. It makes the lighting and the transitioning between sets much faster. This is a little bit of that. This has a little bit of that curved wall going on. Clearly black plexi here. And then these look like they're... Um, Either LEDs built into it, which is probably what it is, so basically Christmas lights, or it's uh, translucent and being backlit, which I, I don't think that's what it is. Another scene here, we have the Oculus head in overslung mode. Pretty cool to get, um, I don't know why. <laughs> for some reason, for some reason, and they're basically putting the base somewhere and swinging the arm, and these sets, even though they may appear to be like uh, linear in a row, most likely are kind of octagonal or kind of built in a curve so that you could put the base of a technocrine in the middle of it and just swing the arm versus having to move the camera uh, perfectly straight. Hopefully that makes sense. Maybe I should make a previous episode about that. That's kind of a high-end technique though. This is a more traditional uh, set here uh, and the base is going to be over there. Base is that way and the arm is likely um, came from up here and tracked down to here. So they swung the arm and extended as it came down and came down as well. 10K and a very large Chimera with the old school um, grids that do have a bit of a belly, no big deal. 
I'm assuming um, looks like kind of a, a neutral colored psych and they're lighting it what I'm guessing with pink gels is how we're getting the colors here. Space lights from above are now mixed colors. So this one's a little bit purple. This one's a little bit green. I bet these are LED space lights. That's my guess moving forward. I didn't read anywhere and I did not inter interview Linus for certain reasons for this breakdown. Um, here is that kind of ending part of the sequence where uh, the horizon gets hidden because of the color correct. All this becomes just the same tone of black and it's just bokeh of the stars. Uh, and then the, the stars are reflected in the floor as well. We have some shots of that. Here's the techno crane. This looks like another movie bird. Smaller movie bird, maybe? The smaller movie bird with the Oculus head, blue space light, practical. Uh, another shot, again, believe this is Bogdan holding it down. And then, yeah, here's the actual scene. So pretty cool. It looks like the plexi's color graded blue, or maybe they're all a little bit blue. I don't know. Interesting color crack going on. Um, really, really pretty. I like this scene a lot. And then we end this breakdown with Sir Linus Sandgren. Looks like you've got kind of a warm edge light. So a couple park cans, maybe a little bit of warm edge light happening there. Uh, getting the ambient from the bluest, getting the stop from the ambient blue space lights from above. Oh yeah. So that is going to wrap it up for this episode. If you enjoyed the breakdown, give the video a like, subscribe to the channel, and share it with a cinematography nerd friend that might enjoy 40 to 60 minutes of talking about cinematography over some Photoshop slides. That's what we do here. And to plug it once again, if you're interested in seeing some of these big jibs and dollies and these type of things happening IRL May 7th, in Los Angeles at the Chapman Leonard product showcase. I will link to the event below. I'm presenting very briefly. I'm going to vlog it. I'm going to do a whole bunch of stuff. So if you can't make it, I will try to get uh, some sort of coverage for it to you on YouTube. But if you can come out to it and you're in LA, I would love to see you there at the event. If you have any questions or you anything you'd like to add to this breakdown, like you were on set for it. I know a lot of the crew watch these now. Kind of, kind of cool, kind of nerve wracking at the same time. Let me know if I got something wrong and there's something else you wanted to add. I think that the community overall, this is a great place to learn about and appreciate movies like this. And of course, this one, Best Cinematography. So it needs to be appreciated. And <laughs> that's what we've done today. I will see you guys on the next episode. You get out there and plan better, shoot better. I lit myself with the Aperture 120 Daylight with the Fresnel lens, pretty spotted in. And that's about it. Uh, I tried to black out the windows in the room, but it didn't work out. So uh, it's not dark. <laughs> And I'm just using my old, like, favorite LED light from Ikea. I love this thing to death. And that's what's going on. I'm going to add a little bit of blues to the blacks and the color correct. And that's how we made this episode look like this. I wish there wasn't a stand and I wish I had more time to make it look better. But at least I tried a little bit. I tried. I tried. I'll see you guys later.